Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to talk about inheritance and composition. What they are, when you should use them, or at least when I use them, and um, kind of what, what to watch out for. Before we dig in though, I want to start with an example of a character that I think is set up badly, or a script for a character that at least, that I think is set up badly and uh, should be broken apart, either with inheritance or composition, and then we'll dive into how that would happen and what it would look like. So to begin, we've got this character here. He's just a little capsule with a bad character script on him. He's got a field for a first name, a move speed, some starting health, and a checkbox to see if he's a player. Already feels kind of dirty. So let's open that script up and see what it looks like. So in here, my aptly named bad character script, we've got some fields here for name. We've got a move speed. We've got a health, a player check. These are all the things that we saw in the editor. Remember, they show up because the serialized field attribute is there. And um, they're set as protected because in the other example, we are um, using inheritance. Uh, for this bad character, it doesn't really matter. Imagine it's just the same as being private. Um, now, in Awake, we set our health to the starting health, and then we can take some damage. If we take damage, we die. Dying is just destroying it. And then in our update, we have this check. If it is a player, do movement from input. Otherwise, do some AI movement. And the AI movement's not filled in, but the you know input for a character was just based off of an axis, like a joystick or something. So this would move a character around, and if we hooked up something for the AI, we could toggle it to be a player or not a player and have it move around. And it seems reasonable, right? And I guess if this were the entirety of the code for the character, it probably wouldn't be so bad. It would be a little bit messy because we're doing a couple different things in here. We're reading input, dealing with health, um, killing this thing, handling its life cycle. But um, it wouldn't be terrible because we're only at 50 something lines. It's still small enough that anybody could comprehend it. But in a realistic situation, this is gonna grow, right? We're not gonna have just starting health. We may have some other attributes on here. We may have a mana thing or a number of cards or whatever it is for your game. And it's gonna keep adding and adding and adding. We keep getting more and more things. And what I see a lot of is people do this and they just start building up these big giant monster classes that, you know, this a thousand lines, 2,000, 3,000 lines, just full of a bunch of logic that really should be split up and it's super hard to follow, really hard to refactor, hard to split things out. And you start ending up with a lot of this kind of crap, this check to see like, hey, is this a player? Is this box checked? If this box is checked, go do a totally different flow of stuff. You know? And it, like I said, gets to be pretty problematic as soon as you build it into a bigger project. So let's jump over to some of the alternatives. The first one I wanted to talk about and look at is just using inheritance. So in this inheritance folder, here, let's slide that down. By the way, if you hold control and mouse wheel up and down, it adjusts that view. I like to go to the list view when I'm looking at most things that aren't images. It's also this little slider down here. Anyway, let's open up the player character and take a look. So the player character class is actually not doing much. Well, oh, oh, cause we want to look at the character first. I opened up the wrong one. So we want to open up character. Character is doing a decent amount cause this is our base class. This class has the first name, it's got a move speed, it's got starting health and health. It has all of the things that our character would need, whether it's a player or an NPC. So if it's an NPC, it needs health. If it's a player, it needs health. They both move, they both have names. It also has the shared functionality of taking damage. So our players and our NPCs take damage. If they take too much, they die. Okay, makes sense so far. Now let's go back to that player character that I skipped ahead to earlier and take a look at this guy. So here you'll see that in in the player character we're actually using the update method. Again, in the character, we weren't using update. If we were, we would have to call into that base update and we'd have to do an override. Um, right now we're not. In fact, let me just show you how to do that real quick. So if we were needing to do something down here, we'd do a protected, oops, protected virtual void update. Um, and this would like do something in the in the base update, and then in the player character we would call we would change this to be protected override void update, and here you'd want to call base dot update. So that's just going to make it call into the update on the base class. And remember the base class is just defined here by putting a colon after the class name. So our player character is inheriting from character. 
Um, right now it's actually calling into the base update method. It doesn't do anything, but it's calling it. And then we're calling this do movement from input. And here we're just getting the movement axis from the axes again and then moving the thing. Cool. That that's perfect for a player. You know, we want the player to move around based on input. But let's look at the NPC. The NPC would be different, right? So on the oh let's change this back to protected override since we're calling into the base and do base dot update. Now in here we may want to do our movement totally different. So instead of reading the input, our NPC has a method called do AI movement, and then this would figure out how the character would move around. And this might seem like a perfectly fine way to split things up, right? Like you've got a base set of functionality, then you've got a bigger set of functionality. A lot of the time this works. It works great if you're doing really small things too. I use this all the time with relatively small classes um, that, that aren't doing a whole lot of things. In this case though, we're still gonna end up with a situation where our character and our NPC are doing quite a bit unless we start splitting things out. But we're also gonna run into some weird edge cases, right? So say we've got another type of NPC that's not just a regular NPC, but maybe it's a, a merchant, right? And then the merchant, you know, it's an NPC, it should spawn and maybe walk around, you can interact with it, but we don't want it doing whatever this AI movement is. Or maybe in here we've got like a do combat stuff. And then this is, you know, responsible for making him go get aggro and attack things. If it's a merchant, we don't want to call this and just like check to see, hey, if I'm a merchant, like w what you could end up doing and what I see done a lot is things like, here, let's just code it up. So we'd have another class here, public class merchant, NP and it would inherit from an NPC. And then on here, it would have like a public uh, list of string uh, get items, whatever. Uh, return null. We're just not going to give back an actual list. Here, actually, let's just make it a string. It'll return back a, a list of items. Uh, right now, it's just totally fake. So what would happen here, though, like I see people do this. They'll create this merchant, but then when they spawn their merchant, it's still running this do combat stuff. And what usually ends up happening is something like, hey, if this is merchant, return. Like, don't do this if this is a merchant. Still... Like I said, it works, but it's getting sloppy. It's um, not following solid principles at all, and things are gonna get problematic. Now again, that doesn't mean don't use inheritance. There are a lot, a lot of cases where inheritance is perfect. Um, one thing that I've found personally is if I'm inheriting some, from something that's not an abstract class like this, there's a good chance that there's somewhat of a design problem and we should probably refactor things. Uh, by the way, an abstract class just means that you can't implement or instantiate an instance of that class. So our character class could never be added on to a component or created with like a new character call or something. In, in this case, it's a model behavior. So we couldn't just add a character. We could only add something that has character as a base class. Um, but like I said, a lot of time I'll use this for small things um, where there's an abstract class that kind of defines functionality, but the way that I want it to react is totally different between classes. A lot like using an interface, but with a little bit of shared functionality. Now let's take a real quick look in game and see what this guy would look like. So here under this inheritance section, I've got an NPC, first name, move speed, starting health exactly the same really because remember all of these fields are on the NPC or on the character in fact let's um let's add another field here like um serialize field I'm gonna make it a string string uh, class name like player class name and maybe this is like um uh, what's a good class a bard right play that in lots of lots of games right so if we do that, I just want to show what happens in the inspector. You will see this new attribute show up, this one. It's always going to be at the end. It's going to be after the base class, unless you go in and build your custom inspector. So the base class attributes will show up, and then the um, inherited class will show up. And then so, so if you keep going down and inheriting more and more and adding fields, you're going to keep seeing them added onto the bottom. Again, not the best solution. The best solution, in my opinion, for these kind of situations at least, is to use more of a composition model. 
So let's take a look. I'm just gonna start in Unity and take a look at these. And you can see here on the player, instead of one component, we've now got three components. We've got a movement component, we've got a health component, and we have a player input controller. If we look at the NPC, almost exactly the same, right? Character movement, a health, and an AI movement controller. So let's take a look at how this is all put together. Let's go into the composition folder. And I'm gonna start with, well, let's start with character movement. So the character movement component is super lightweight. It defines the movement speed of the character and it does the moving. Now it doesn't figure out how much to move because that's not its responsibility. It's not in charge of figuring out movement. How it figures out movement could be done any way we want. We could do it over the network. It could be like network packets coming in, moving our character around. It could be a, a controller, it could be an AI, and we could switch it at runtime, you know, just toggle it. We just need to call move with something else. Now, let's look at another one. Let's look at the player input controller. So player input controller, you'll see, now has a reference to a character movement. In fact, in this case, if I were setting this one up and making these actual components, I would add a require component attribute and pass in type of and give it the character movement. What this is gonna do is tell the inspector or the editor to force a character movement onto this uh, game object. And it'll also make it so you can't remove the player input controller, or you can't remove the character movement component, I mean, if the player input controller is there because it'll know that it requires it. So in here, in start, which actually probably should be awake. In awake, we cache the character movement and then in update, oh, we're not actually calling it. So we call character movement dot move and pass in our movement amount. Now again, this may seem more complex, but imagine the possibilities here. Now we can swap out this movement. We don't have to just use a player, um, you know, we don't have to use the player input controller or the character movement, we can swap them and kind of make them interchangeable and hook them up. Um, let me jump one more time over to the health component. So the health component again, starting health and a health amount in awake, we just reset the health basically, take damage and then have it die. Now one thing I would change in a, in a real project, instead of the health component killing the game object and just destroying it, what I'd much more likely do is add in some sort of an event or callback when this character is going to die and then have that propagate out and maybe then it, the uh, pooling system will remove this thing from the pool and any particle systems would clean up. And that would look something like this. It'd have like a public event action, um, whoops, action. Let's add using dot system dot, by the way, that's control period to bring up that little menu in Visual Studio. Uh, and this action would be like a on died so, something like that. And then down here in die, we go if on died is not equal to null. So it just means if something has registered for that event, then I call on died. And then the things registering for the event would handle all the cleanup instead of the health destroying it. Like I said, it'd be like the pooling system would register for this on died message, um, particle systems or anything else on the character that really cares. And that way we're moving more and more of this functionality into uh, the right places, kind of out of the wrong places like this. Uh, and then the last one on here, I think was just an AI movement controller. Um, actually, well, I, I wrote some code, so why not pull it up? So here again, you'll see we have a, a requirement for a nav mesh agent and a character movement. I didn't put the attributes there, but they should be there. And then we cache the nav mesh agent and we don't cache the character movement in here. So here we go, character movement equals get component character movement. There we go, fix the code live. So then in update, it's like figuring out a new point and then moving in that direction. Not very good code for moving things around, like I said, just because we're recalculating the path and just moving it manually. I'd clean this up, but I think you kind of get the idea. We're still calling into character movement.move just from a totally different source and it doesn't care and then everything is just composed on these objects. So if I want to change this NPC to work like a player, I can simply remove this component, the AI movement controller, and drop in a player input controller. And this is really useful when you're going in and like debugging a game, testing things out. You know, you, maybe you want to take control over some NPC, you just want to swap it, swap it right here. You could also hook it up in code so that you could swap these components at runtime um, or even make them not 
game object components and just have them be regular old classes that you swap and instantiate at runtime. Um, anyway, I hope this kind of clarifies the difference. Again, inheritance, still really valuable. It's just not, um, it's not a go-to for everything. It's not like the end all solution. You should use a, a mix of inheritance and composition in your projects. Um, I always look for composition first, you know, what parts can I pull apart? and slap together to make into something useful. And that's kind of what Unity does, right? We have these objects made up of a bunch of different components, mesh renderer, capsule collider, this capsule, you know, we add a rigid body and a collider, all kinds of stuff. Um, these are all components. The system is built for it, use it, take advantage of it. It'll make your life easier, It'll make your code cleaner and yeah, happy times. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. If you have questions, comments, or just uh, suggestions, please just drop them below. Um, don't forget like, subscribe, and all the fun stuff. Also, um, if you're watching this and it's live, like it just came out, I recently opened up my Unity Mastery course. Um, I'll put a link in the description below, but you can go check it out. It's only open until uh, next week, then class starts, and we will be going on for six weeks, just kind of diving into Unity in depth. Um, building out a bunch of games and having a lot of fun. All right. Thanks again for watching.